very good morning to all this is the second uh, episode of a glow webinar this is intended mainly to the postgraduate students all over india and uh, i think uh, this will benefit you both during your examination and as well as your clinical practice so be careful and get maximum benefit out of these presentations um today the first speaker is dr saumya jagadish who is very well known to dermatologists and post, probably dermatology postgraduate students she is the kiss master of iadvr um, i mean for a very long time she herself is a winner of uh, the national kiss and uh, um, very um, and, um, very well known in dermatology parlance and uh, she has conducted lot of kisses all the all over the country and in uh, different forum she is presently working as the additional professor of dermatology in uh speaker sir since uh, some disturbances i i i muted all kindly speakers unmute themselves and speak up second sir you can unmute yourself sir sir ah uh, yes sir yeah so uh, dr saumya jagadish is, uh, is uh, very well known to dermatology parlance and she is presently the additional professor of dermatology in amrita institute of medical sciences very enthusiastic but i mean um, i should not say budding dermatologist she is already a veteran dermatologist and uh, a kiss master par excellence she will be talking on the exfoliative psoriasis it is a very intriguing problem and uh, she will lighten us on exfoliative uh, exfoliative psoriasis after her talk she will be giving a uh, four questions which the audience can answer and the first um, correct answer will be awarded in the next uh, webinar so over to you soumya thank you very much kriten sir for the uh, kind introduction a very good morning to all i really enthused to see this uh, very uh, what I, what do i say creative ambitious program which has been conceptualized for uh, the residents benefit uh, thank you kriten sir team amala is best everybody for doing this i hope this will be of benefit uh, so uh, what i have been asked to speak is on exfoliative dermatitis that too from a postgraduate uh, point of view so i'll just uh, share my presentation can uh, the host please enable screen sharing for me Yes. Ma'am, you can share it, ma'am. Oh, okay. It is it says notes. disabled participant screen share. One second, ma'am. One second, ma'am. Yeah. Ma'am, uh, shall I do one thing, ma'am? I will make you host. So oh, after okay. you are sharing, you can you can uh, make me one second host, ma'am. Alright. Ma okay, that's perfect. Done, ma'am. Okay. uh it still says disable participant screen sharing i don't know why earlier it was possible pardon ma'am it still says disabled uh, participant screen sharing i make you host uh, earlier earlier you tried ma'am you shared yes 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 now 
madam uh, two madam you are using two two devices ma'am yeah now i have switched off so please make me the yeah one second okay my god did i got right. it madam right. you are in other device okay madam yeah. you do one thing madam one yeah. second make me host madam one second make me host madam. your device you are using i, I logged out now. of it i logged out of it okay okay no problem no problem no i'll do it i'll do it madam you can do now okay yeah all right yeah now it is going on i hope yeah yeah yes ma'am thank you sorry for that uh, slight technical delay i hope my slides are visible now so we'll be just talking a bit about uh, exfoliative psoriasis so i'll start with a case uh, this was an actual case which we had seen a 65 year old man with a history of reddish scaly lesions over the body since the last 32 years his initial lesions were limited to the back scalp legs palms and soles over the years slowly and gradually he has developed new lesions which now involve almost the entire body surface area he has been on topical treatment mainly so far with some history of forays into alternative medicine systems as is usually seen in our practice so this was the clinical picture a patient with these erythematous scaly lesions uh, who uh, was suffering from these since around 32 years and gradually his uh, almost the entirety of his body surface area is involved there are no constitutional symptoms on examination he is febrile he is very active still there is erythema and scaling involving almost the entire body surface area which you can see is a little bit of sparing in between there was scalp scaling nails showed pitting dystrophic changes and his joints and systems were within normal limits so i think it is very straightforward especially since we are discussing something uh today here so what i want to know is the clinical diagnosis clinical diagnosis uh, even without uh, histopathology or other uh, very complicated lab tests most of us that first differential diagnosis would be yes erythrodermic psoriasis or exfoliative psoriasis with such a history nail involvement scalp involvement and the gradual course but yeah i also want to focus on the subtypes here many of us do know but some of us may not be aware that yes we do see subtypes of uh, exfoliative psoriasis even when psoriasis involves the entire body surface area almost the entire body surface area it's not uniform there are subtypes there are patterns which has got different prognostic implications so this is called the chronic subtype where the individual is usually systemically well uh, the clinical characteristics of psoriasis is more or less retained you are able to make out from seeing the morphology of the lesions that this is probably psoriasis and there is yes there are some areas of spared and involved skin and the patient might do well on topical treatments of course not when the body surface area exceeds and the overall prognosis is good so before i of course when there is a chronic subtype there has to be an acute subtype also so before i go into those subtypes we will just uh, look at erythrodermic psoriasis or exfoliative psoriasis in a nutshell it's a rare and severe variant of psoriasis why rare uh, because it involves only around 1 to 2 percentage among psoriatic patients there is generalized inflammatory erythema with or without exfoliation involving at least 75% yes we know that the definition of erythroderma says 90 percentage many of the uh, standard textbooks talk about 90 percentage of the body surface area having erythema and scaling however there is there are also other authors who state 75% or they don't create uh, they, they haven't talked about a strict delineation like 75 or 90% and just talk about almost entire body surface area so i think we can be more lenient here 75 to 90% of body surface area or almost the entire body surface area is involved uh, with er generalized inflammatory erythema and edema in case of exfoliative or erythrodermic psoriasis regarding the terminology also i think there have been a uh, question sometimes examiners ask these questions we do regard the rooks talk about the exfoliative dermatitis which patrick talks about erythroderma so we've actually given them uh, you know geographical connotations but also when there is more of erythema evident we've called erythroderma in indian skin scaling is easier to understand so we've been using the term exfoliative uh, exfoliative dermatitis more but i guess the, uh, the the distinction is not very very strict Uh, but in case this is my uh, understanding about this so it's a rare and severe variant uh, severe because yes it can be potentially potentially life threatening in certain cases and furthermore psoriatic erythroderma is also one of the most 
common cause of erythroderma. Among erythrodermas, it accounts for 25 to 40 percent case. So it's it's very important to know about psoriatic erythroderma, and we don't uh, we en we encounter it quite commonly in our clinical practice. I'm sure all of you do. So uh, clinical presentation. Psoriatic erythroderma affects all body sites, including the face, hands, feet, nails, trunk, and extremities. Uh, and although uh, symptoms of psoriasis are present, erythema is the most prominent feature that is in Western skin. And the scaling of uh, in, in Caucasian skin, I meant, yeah, we do get to see erythema in our skin, but it may be uh, kind of camouflaged and you do see the pigmentation more in certain cases. And the scaling uh, in uh, exfoliative psoriasis is somewhat different from the normal psoriasis. Instead of the thick adherent white scales, sometimes you see the superficial scales, so the diffuse scales. Nail changes in exfoliative psoriasis are very common and it can range from mild pitting to severe onychodystrophy. And uh, literature states that fingernails are more commonly involved when compared to toenails. And uh, also because of the occlusion of the sweat ducts, psoriatic skin may be hypohydrotic. And because of the hypohydrosis, there can be an attendant risk of hyperthermia also in the warm climate. So we know that there can be hypothermia, but hyperthermia can also occur because of the occlusion of sweat ducts. So it can affect uh, the appendages like your nails, your hair, and your sweat glands as well. So coming back to our uh, two distinct subtypes, erythrodermic psoriasis. So we talked about the chronic subtype where the psoriatic plaques with gradual additional development of generalized erythroderma in which the psoriatic plaques remain differentiable from erythroderma. There is in acute subtype what happens, I think we have seen this though, we, uh, you know, as far as psoriasis is concerned, erythroderma is rare. We do see a psoriatic exfoliative dermatitis, exfoliative psoriasis, not uncommonly. So we have seen these different variants also where uh, there is a rapid involvement of uh, the entire body surface area with erythema and the lack of demarcated psoriatic plaques. The entire skin may be affected and the clinical characteristics of psoriasis are often lost. And the patient may have systemic features like fever, maybe feeling ill, edema is more common, itching is sometimes present and very severe. So this I have just made this to differentiate between the two types, the acute and chronic uh, exfoliative psoriasis. Mind you, these, these uh, definitions are for understanding the disease better. They, these are by no means very strict or very well classified. But yes, most textbooks are talking about these subtypes. So in the acute erythrodermic psoriasis, it's uh, very rapidly progressive and acute, whereas in the chronic form, it's a more prolonged kind of course. And as we said earlier, in the acute form, the psoriatic features may not be very ev evident. Uh, you might just understand this as erythroderma and you might need to probe more to get the uh, diagnosis of psoriasis confirmed there. Whereas in the chronic subtype, it's of psoriasis features are still very prominent. You might see the demarcated plaques with areas of sparing in between and the course is also very gradual, like we said. In acute erythrodermic psoriasis, the constitutional features are very prominent where it is uh, not so much, not that prominent in the chronic type. Sorry for that uh, mistake there. And in the acute form, the course is unstable and is more likely to be associated with abnormal vital signs and laboratory values also. Whereas in the chronic form, it's stable and lab abnormalities are less likely. In the acute form, prognosis is less favorable with more mortality, chances of more mortality. Whereas in the chronic form, mortality would be less when compared to the acute form. Of course, there are other rarer subtypes which have been described other than the acute and the chronic ones. Triggered exfoliative psoriasis has been uh, classified as a subtype by some authors, whereas some authors have classified the triggered uh, exfoliative psoriasis in conjunction with the acute. So, uh, the triggered can be uh, considered as a part of the acute uh, exfoliative psoriasis or as a separate subtype where it is often precipitated by the tr triggers like systemic illness, alcoholism, anti-malarials, withdrawals of rapid withdrawal of systemic topical uh, systemic corticosteroids or uh, generalized application of topical corticosteroids or other immunomodulators like cyclosporin or methotrexate. And also it can represent a generalized Kubner reaction when we've been applying irritating topical treatments or ultraviolet radiation. So that is a triggered subtype. There's also a very rare subtype called the congenital uh, exfoliative psoriasis, but this is very rare. 
and also some authors have uh, regarded the uh, resolved pustule phase of generalized pustular psoriasis as a variant of exfoliative psoriasis. So these are the various subtypes which has, have been described in uh, exfoliative psoriasis, which actually uh, they actually represent a various type of clinical presentations with little uh, you know, extra connotations regarding the course and the prognosis. But let us uh, say, reiterate here that this is no by no means watertight and they can be overlap. Regarding histopathology, yes, it's a very important uh, uh, diagnostic tool to uh, help us uh, uh, confirm the uh, clinical diagnosis, especially in the acute variants. So you usually see epidermal perivascular infiltrate of lymphocytes and eosinophils, dilated capillaries, and of course, hyperkeratosis as well. And is, uh, in the chronic subtypes and all, you actually would see additional features of class classical psoriasis like parakeratosis, spongiosis, psoriasis or macanthosis, spongiosis, micromandrapsis, and sometimes even apoptotic keratinocytes can be seen in this. However, because of exfoliation, loss of stratum corneum and all that, you might not see as much of micromandrapsis and parakeratosis uh, yeah. as in your normal psoriasis vulgaris or plaque psoriasis. Now, regarding the pathogenesis, of course, that question does come up in our mind. Why does this kind of variant, exfoliative psoriasis, occur? It's not yet fully understand compared to our chronic plaque psoriasis or psoriasis vulgaris. There are a lot of, because all our understanding so far is only based on small uh, you know, case series or individual case reports, a very small time. There have been authors, uh, literature says that there has been reported a statistically significant increase in IgE levels. IgE level increase actually points towards a Th2 shift. And also Th2 cytokines like interleukin-4 and interleukin-10 pointing towards a bias to Th2. We know that in psoriasis vulgaris, it's an interplay of more of Th1 and Th17 and all that. So here there has been there have been hints about a bias towards Th2, but Th1 cytokines have also been found to be increased in certain studies. Uh, so we are still not clear that the uh, increase in biomarkers, Th2 biomarkers that we see in exfoliative psoriasis, whether it's actually due to the disease or due to a uh, it indicates a resolution of disease because often in therapeutics, a uh, shift towards Th2 indicates resolution of disease in psoriasis. So that could also be one of the factors is what some authors have postulated. And TNF-alpha has also been shown to be expressed in both plaque psoriasis lesions. And here also a rapid systemic release of TNF-alpha has been found, has been thought to be responsible for the disease onset and severity. So, uh, so this is the understanding as of now and there is a need for a lot more clarity especially considering the fact that uh, we have already seen that this erythrodermic or exfoliative psoriasis is not a very homogeneous entity it can be heterogeneous having different uh, connotations so i don't think we need to go into so much of details but this is just for your understanding the so these are the uh, some of the uh, uh, studies that have been done regarding biomarkers and all that erythrodermic psoriasis so th2 response i think here in implications you can see Zhang et al. has uh, found more of a Th2 response. And of course, ICAM, VCAM, Groves et al. ICAM, VCAM also have been found to contribute to the immunosuppressive state. So don't think we need so much of details. Now we'll quickly move into the course and complications of exfoliative psoriasis, which is more relevant to us. So untreated, the course is prolonged, relapses are frequent, and there is an appreciable mortality. Uh, yes, there is, there is a risk of mortality at least. Uh, so complications can be are actually identical to those of a skin failure or other causes of erythroderma also like sepsis, hypo or hyperthermia, hypoalbuminemia, dehydration, high output paddock failure, so on and so forth. So this is uh, the point to introduce this concept also called skin failure, which is very relevant when we talk about exfoliative psoriasis, especially when regards to the management. And many of our viva questions also in examinations can deal with the complications, consequence, course, which are directly related to skin failure and also there are management when as a clinician you're managing. So that is why I brought up this topic here. Skin failure was actually defined by this, this paper by C. Irvine uh, and uh, it means the inability to perform the normal functions of skin. So he defined it as a loss of normal temperature control with inability to maintain the core body temperature, failure to prevent the percutaneous loss of fluid, electrolytes and protein, with resulting imbalance and failure of the mechanical barrier to penetration by foreign materials. 
So due to these, there are a lot of consequences. So because of exfoliative psoriasis, what are the consequences that we're dealing with? One is altered hemodynamics because there is persistent inflammation of skin and a you know, large body surface area. So this leads to marked peripheral vasodilatation and the increased cutaneous blood flow. So what happens because of this uh, increased cutaneous blood flow, venous return would increase, there'll be more preload, there'll be increased cardiac output, which in an elderly person can already compromise, uh, if it, uh, CVS is already compromised, this can result in high output cardiac failure, which we often talk about as a complication. Altered thermoregulation also, because there is increased cutaneous blood flow, there is heat loss also because of convection and radiation, which results in hypothermia. And as a result of the compensatory mechanisms for against hypothermia, like raised BMR, maybe try to increase body ties to increase the metabolic rate to make up for heat loss, more shivering, attempts to raise core, core body temperature. So if it is corrected, it is corrected. Failure to compensate can lead to poikilothermia. So both hypo and hyperthermia can. So hyperthermia also we talked about earlier because of the occlusion of the sweat ducts. It can also lead to hypohydrosis and hyperthermia also. Hypothermia can also occur here. Then metabolic abnormalities can occur, like we said, as a compensation for heat loss. And there is increased basal metabolic uh, I mean, uh, uh, rate. And they can also develop hyperglycemic state and glycosuria. Why does this occur? Because of uh, associated pancreatitis. There can be reduced insulin secretion, relative insulin resistance, stress and infection, which are all seen with uh, exfoliative psoriasis. And uh, this altered glucose metabolism also enhances calorie loss by depleting tissue protein as the energy loss because of tissue catabolism and uh, shivering as a compensatory mechanism for hypothermia which we, uh, which we saw earlier this is also highly can energy consuming so there can be calorie loss here also so these metabolic abnormalities can also be seen we have to look out for them and manage them accordingly very important is uh, as a consequence of exfoliative psoriasis we can see fluid electrolyte imbalance a normal water loss through skin is of course 400 ml per day and even more but this is greatly increased in exfoliative psoriasis because of the skin involvement the barrier function is also less in increased transepidermal water loss because of the inflammation in skin and if uh, fluid replacement is not adequate there is a reduction in the intravascular volume and that can also result in formation of hyperosmolar urine this can result in dehydration and reduced urinary output and consequent electrolyte imbalance that is low sodium and high hypo Natremia and hyperkalemia. This can also result in a pre renal kind of uremia and raised, you could see raised serum levels of urea and creatinine. So, the, uh, the other thing is in patients with generalized pustular psoriasis, the officer would be taking that up. They can also develop hypocalcemia, which can be secondary to the protein loss, severe hypoalbuminemia that is seen in psoriasis. It can even occur in exfoliative psoriasis. So these uh, fluid electrolyte imbalance also we have to monitor and have to be aware about. Then the other very important consequence is loss of nutrients. Not only through skin, it can also occur otherwise. So main loss is of what protein and iron. There can be hypoproteinemia and anemia. What are the causes of hypoproteinemia? This is often asked again in exams. One is, of course, through uh, scales, uh, shed scales, you are losing protein through scales. So that is one of the important causes. Then there is a reduced hepatic synthesis of proteins uh, here. So that, that's also one cause of hypoproteinemia. Then there is dermatogenic entropathy here, which can lead to protein loss. Then there is dilution due to hypervolemia. Again, but that's not very significant. This is a very important cause of hypoproteinemia, which we see in exfoliative dermatitis or exfoliative psoriasis. The normal material that is exfoliated from skin is scales around 500 to 1000 milligrams per day. And it is increased several folds in exfoliative dermatitis. That is 9 grams per meter square body surface area per day. And in case of diffuse scaling, the protein loss would be approximately 20 to 30 grams per meter square body surface area per day. So these figures also we might need to know. And besides proteins, we might lose other nutrients also. Like uh, addition to the loss through shed skin, there is impaired absorption and utilization of iron and vitamin B12. And because of the increased cellular turnover rate, there can also be accompanying folate deficiency. So you might use iron, B12 and folate. So these can all contribute to anemia. So hypoproteinemia and anemia, we have to look out for in exfoliative psoriasis like in other cases of exfoliative dermatitis. But psoriasis, we know there is significant protein loss. Now, peripheral edema is also quite common. We said, especially in the acute variant. So what are the causes of peri peripheral edema? One is this increased uh, capillary leakage and consequent shift of fluid to the 
extra vascular spaces and because of this there is significantly increased levels of uh, uh, there is uh, there is uh, there are studies have said that VEGF vascular endothelial growth factor is significantly increased both in serum as well as uh, actually in the IHC studies in skin biopsies also they found VEGF so this can uh, lead to increased uh, capillary leakage and loss and of course hypoalbuminemia we discussed right uh, uh, right now so that can also lead to peripheral edema cardiac failure high output cardiac failure can lead to it and also the inflammatory edema resulting from the disease so these are the causes of that and of course sepsis is the other consequence because of the damaged barrier function of skin this predisposes to colonization and entry of microorganism though we say that in psoriasis the chances less there can be because of the impaired skin barrier we have to be on the lookout and also altered immune functions like cytopenias chemotaxis, chemotaxis and uh, phagocytosis impaired this can also increases susceptibility for infections pulmonary complications aspiration pneumonitis is common in most of the bedridden patients so we have to be on the lookout and counsel the bystanders or the nursing staff and the uh, patients regarding uh, the proper uh, methods and severe pulmonary edema and ARDS can occur in any case of skin failure and overzealous collection of uh, correction of hypovolemia can also result in pulmonary edema so these were the consequences and course that we need to be aware uh, when you're dealing with exfoliative psoriasis. Now I'll quickly talk about management, uh, the considerations that we should have. First of all, in managing any case of erythroderma or skin failure, and particularly erythrodomic psoriasis, which can be quite, uh, it, it, there is a risk of mortality, you require well-synchronized teamwork. Dermatologists should work in as a team along with the internal physician and ICU uh, uh, critical care team and of course uh, very good nursing care so this is very important and uh, nursing care monitoring hemodynamic changes fluid electrolyte balance and nutrition prevention of complications like sepsis prompt identification of risk factors and topical therapy all these are very important pillars of management the concept of ICU I think right answer has taught us when we were PGs a lot about this these things so this concept was first concept, uh, conceptualized by Professor Renu Turin in 1976 and since then I think uh, may, may, there are many centers who have ICU management if not at least specialized wards or uh, setup is required for managing such patients who are at risk and assessment of the severity of disease helps in planning and management that's also important you have to assess the disease severity before undertaking management so disease specific scoring systems in this particular case like PASI always helps you and of course for other purposes PASI doesn't help you to you know for replacing fluid and all that because you need to know the body surface area then so like the rules of rule of nines all these things are also important so you should have a, a good scoring system before you start managing so regarding nursing care and general men which before going to specific i'll just talk about the general measures so like we said icu or burns unit or specialized ward is very essential ambient temperature of 30 to 32 degrees celsius if lamina flow is there well and good regular cleaning and removal of crust from the oral and nasal cavities is required along with care of the eyes genitalia and perianal region very very important once or twice daily bathing or sponging in lukewarm water if the condition allows if there are denuded area, uh, areas of skin, dressings are important and of course monitoring of vitals and the intake output chart. Just discuss the uh, specifics of these hemodynamic monitoring and fluid and all that. So always look out for these are the things sometimes that we may miss uh, or if in case we miss we have to work in close association as a team with our internal physician colleague. Look out for hypovolemia, monitoring pulse rate, urine output and urine osmolality. This is very important because BP might not always help. BP may be maintained by release of catecholamines because of the stress state. So hypotension is not a very reliable criteria. Look for the pulse rate, look for urine output and urine osmolality. Urine output of 50 to 100 ml per hour and osmolality lower than 1020 are indicative of adequate tissue perfusion. And pulse rate, if it's 120 or more per minute, even in the uh, presence of respiratory factors like septicemia and fever, it indicates a negative fluid balance. So you, it's, this, these are signs of hypovolemia. That means you have to replace the fluid. So how do you replace the fluid? Intravascular fluid loss must be replaced quickly. And thereafter, the total body water and electrolytes can be restored gradually. So the initial choice are colloids like uh, albumin of fresh frozen plasma and normal saline. Albumin is usually thought to be a better choice than plasma because there is no risk of infections there. And uh, of course, you have to use the Parkland formula and daily fluid requirements with acute skin failure. It has to be calculated, but it's of course two-thirds for skin conditions. 
and a combination of intravenous and enteral supplement. If the patient is able to take uh, oral oral uh, fluids, a combination has to be given, and the diet should be high in protein, that is two to three gram per kilogram body weight per day in adults and three to four gram per kilogram body weight per day in children. So this chart gives you a rough idea about uh, whether it's IV fluid or nasogastric uh, feeding that you are undertaking and how to replace uh, the what kind of IV fluids are to be used, how to look out for electrolytes and uh, whether potassium uh, in case of hypokalemia, in case of hyponatremia and also uh, by uh, oral intake. Disease-specific management, yes, biologics may be considered in affording patients. Uh, I, I think I, I am uh, I'm, uh, uh, nearing the end of the presentation. Yeah, so biologics may be considered in uh, affording patients, especially with acute forms for rapid response. Uh, initially, in a, we, uh, there are different schools of thought regarding management of um, uh, psoriatic exfoliative psoriasis because after all it represents a severe form of psoriasis so there can be patient and uh, physician preferences but uh, the textbooks have talked about using uh, methotrexate and retinoids retinoids have been considered to be gold standard uh, though there are uh, there are authors who state that uh, it may be better in the chronic type and there you have the acute variant, acute unstable variant. Biologics do have a very important role because they have a very rapid response. Particularly, uh, IL-17 inhibitors, uh, secukinumab is available here. Infliximab is the, the one with the most rapid response. So I won't go into much details, just give you, giving you a nutshell. And most of the guidelines uh, now uh, also talk about using both biologics as well as non-conventional agents in managing severe erythrodermic psoriasis so you could uh, you could also talk about biologics when you're managing in, especially in affording patients when managing exfoliative psoriasis um so uh, the other drugs of course conventional methotrexate uh, in higher doses in fact parenteral or subcutaneous injections of methotrexate have been preferred by certain authors as uh, more uh, rapid response and of course, escitritin is the uh, classic time-tested drug for managing severe psoriasis, including erythrodermic psoriasis, especially the chronic variants. Cyclosporin has its role, uh, especially uh, when we talk about pregnancy and conditions like that. And uh, the choice of drug is also governed by the comorbidities. In patients with hepatic abnormalities, of course, methotrexate may have issues. Uh, also, in patients with cytopenias, you might be having uh, issues with methotrexate and cyclosporin. So, the choice of drug is governed by a lot of other factors also. So, um, so uh, Titan says, shall I go for the questions? The uh, Go ahead. Go ahead. Or should I ask for any questions first from the... Uh, yeah, both way. Both way it is okay. All right. So, if the participants may be uh, allowed to uh, unmute themselves, uh, I could ask any, any, uh, or you could put it in the chat box. Uh, uh, sir, I think I'll ask the questions first and then go for that because okay. otherwise okay. I'll have to uh, undo the screen. Okay. Um, I mean, go out of the screen sharing mode. So, the first question, so I I, I hope it is clear. Uh, what whatever we have discussed, uh, erythrodermic psoriasis is not discussed in great detail in textbooks. It's just a very small portion. It's thought to be a severe form of psoriasis. That's all. Which is why we talked in terms of erythroderma and skin failure and management aspects regarding that as well. So uh, I'll just give you four questions. Be uh, alert. So as Sir said, the person who answers first, they will be having some prizes. So I hope you're ready. Very very simple questions. Okay. First question, who defines skin failure? Who defines skin failure? Please write in the chat box. I'm not able to see the chat box because I'm in the screen share mode. I hope there are some answers coming. Yes, replies are coming, coming. ma'am. Yes, ma'am, replies are coming. All right, so I will wait. I think we will reveal the answers in the end anyway. Most of them know. Yes. Are you capturing who uh, answered first? Yes, yes, I'm capturing them. I'm capturing. All right, all right. And the doctors are request under the uh, the doctors are request to come by name and their uh, medical college or mobile right, number. Right. So Absolutely. So those who have already uh, uh, texted also, please write your name.
college name as well as the phone number, mobile phone number. So I think if we have answered answer, shall yes. I go to the next question? Yes, ma'am. List two causes of peripheral edema in exfoliative psoriasis. Very easy. Are we getting answers? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Right. Responses are coming. Sir, shall I go to the next question? Yes, yes. Yes, go ahead. Sorry, ICU management in dermatology was first proposed by third question. ICU management in dermatology was first proposed by Shall I go to the last question? Yes, Prognosis is bad in which subtype of exfoliative psoriasis? So if you've listened, I think it's quite easy. And uh, yes, I wish to thank you all, particularly Crichton, sir, uh, for uh, this opportunity. I hope something has been gained from this. And excuse me for any inadvertent I have done. So I'm stopping. Thank you. Thank you, Samia, for your wonderful um, talk on exploitative psoriasis. This is what, um, I mean, uh, it is uh, not very elaborately discussed in um, textbooks. So the um, those who are working with exploitative psoriasis, they not only they can know the intricacies of uh, various forms and its management challenges. And uh, you have done, uh, I mean, exemplarily well to educate the postgraduates. Congratulations. And I hope that postgraduates have benefited out of your talk. Thank you, Samia, once again. Thank you. Um, I think, uh, you can uh, I stop am... sharing the okay okay now i think uh, we will move on to the next topic um i think dr biffy is ready ready sir, is ready. sir am i audible yes sir yeah, it's audible biffy ready you can share the okay Ma, just a few seconds uh, dr biffy is a very good uh, clinician and a good teacher and he has been doing this um, uh, dermatology practice as well as um, teaching dermatology for the last 15 years presently he is the professor of dermatology in periyar medical college and he has a lot of experience in psoriasis, of course. Every teacher will have a lot of experience and the experience should lead to an understanding or um, enlightenment of uh, various aspects and Biffy has enough. So uh, I think the students will be benefited with uh, Dr. Biffy's uh, talk. And you will be talking on vascular psoriasis. Over to you, Biffy. Thank you, sir. Hope my screen is visible. Yeah, yeah, it is visible. Audible to 
isn't it? So yeah, 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 yeah. Thank you so much, right, you sir, for the opportunity, and uh, uh, thank you so much for being so accommodating, sir. The technical snacks, I couldn't take the first session, um, and I think uh, Samia has started it quite well. I will be uh, going into a topic which has been assigned to me by Titan, sir, something which is uh, quite close to my heart, that is a part of psoriasis, and uh, I'll be dealing on postular psoriasis. So I won't be going into uh, too much detail, but uh, I would be, um, before I proceed, uh, I've got no complexity to declare. I will be discussing in the following headings. One is uh, clinical features, then the triggers for the disease, then the differential diagnosis, investigations, how you manage a case, complications, and the recent updates. Now this is, uh, I particularly choose this uh, format because uh, this is a PG webinar, which is a residence webinar where uh, this thing also should be an academic exercise where you can learn how to present uh, a case of postular psoriasis when it comes for your exam or for your clinical case discussion in your uh, departments. So without further ado, uh, the topic today which has been assigned to me is postular psoriasis. And the classical difference between postular psoriasis and conventional psoriasis vulgaris is that psoriasis vulgaris has the classical plaques, but postular psoriasis, the primary lesion is postules. And what you usually see is monomorphic postules, postules of similar morphology, which can be localized to certain areas or which can be uh, distributed in a generalized fashion. So postular psoriasis, there are multiple types, there are multiple variants, and broadly, postular psoriasis is classified into two. It's a localized and the generalized variant. And among the localized is uh, one is the palmar plantar postular psoriasis or palmar plantar postulosis, and the second one is acrodermatitis continua of halopia. While among the generalized is the one which is the one which is extremely serious. It is the acute generalized postural psoriasis of monsoon bush. Secondly, the generalized postural psoriasis of pregnancy. Thirdly, the infantile and juvenile types and the sarcinate and the localized. But here you need to understand this, that uh, this localized means the localized variant of generalized postural psoriasis and not the one which comes under the palms and soles or which is not confined to certain digits only. So this is a localized variant of generalized postural psoriasis. So we'll uh, move on to uh, each entity one by one. The first one is uh, the one which is most important. When you see a case of postural psoriasis, what we are most concerned about or what is most uh, life-threatening and one which has got most amount of morbidity is the von Zumbush type of generalized postural psoriasis. This was first described by Leo von Zumbush. It is as the name suggests, it's a generalized condition. But what is important is that compared to other types of postural psoriasis, this one is potentially life-threatening. And this comes under the broad category or the broad umbrella term of acute skin failure. I think Dr. Soumya had put that as a request in your uh, quiz uh, just preceding this presentation. So it comes, out, uh, comes under the broad uh, term of acute skin failure. Now, how it presents? It presents with a sudden appearance of sheets of sterile monomorphic postures over an earthy matrix background. That is one thing which you need to know. It, should do, it is usually not on a uh, normal or a normal colored background. It's on an earthy matrix background and it gives an uh, appearance of being a uh, fiery red sort of appearance. And once these postures are uh, cropping up, there are multiple crops which come up, that is each episode subsides and the next crop comes up, they coalesce and form what is classically called as the lakes of pus. The skin is usually tender, tender and the tenderness can vary from moderate to severe. This is a predominantly cutaneous condition, but there is a very classical mucous membrane involvement in the tongue. It can involve all the other mucous membranes too, but the tongue shows a characteristic uh, change, which is called Analyst migraines. And analyst migraines is when you have discrete and confluent denuded areas on the tongue with white elevated margin. Now, the features which I had already mentioned, but I have just highlighted once more. There is an acute onset, and um, there are crops of pustules, and it is usually accompanied by very prominent constitutional features that is, fever, headache, malaise, 
arthralgia, etc. It is a dermatological emergency. So much so that what is uh, said so and what is recommended is that the moment you say or diagnose or suspect a case of generalized postural psoriasis, you have to immediately hospitalize and if possible, manage in the dermatology IC because it requires such an emergency case workup and management. Previously, von um, Sumbush type of generalized postural psoriasis was considered as only de novo. But nowadays, it is said so that it can occur on either de novo or on pre-existing black psoriasis issues. As said earlier, the postures can resolve later with lakes of pus, and even these lakes of pus over a period of days to weeks of adequate treatment, uh, leave, leaving behind this condition. In addition to cutaneous changes, uh, the patient will also have extra cutaneous manifestations. The patient will have significant amount of polyarthritis. There will be extensive uveitis uh, to the point that it can, if not managed properly, can lead to uh, eye perforation and even blindness. And then there is a classical uh, entity which is described, which is the neutrophilic cholangitis, where there is a neutrophilic infiltration of the biliary channel. And secondary to the extensive lesions and probably a secondary septicemia and probably all the circulatory disturbances, the patient can go into a circulatory shock and also uh, eventual um, occurrence of ARDS. Second entity is a generalized postural psoriasis of pregnancy. The GPP of pregnancy uh, was initially told us or actually named or uh, misnomer that was given was impetigo herpetiformis. And this is attributed to the very uh, famous yesteryear's dermatologist, Hebra. Uh, now that is basically because it looked like generalized uh, distribution of impetigo lesions and the classical lesions were pustules, but these were not uh, themed with bacteria and these were actually the generalized postular psoriasis confined to pregnancy. It usually occurs in the third trimester, but it can also occur in the first and second trimester. And its clinical pattern is generalized postules and clinical posts, which are quite similar to the Onsum Bush type. And there will be significant constitution features like fever, malaise, and there will be leukocytosis on investigation. Now, one thing which is important here is that it is not just an innocuous disease. It is not uh, that uh, the patient will have a you know, postular episode and it will subside and everything is normal and everything is fine for both the mother and baby. Here in the fetal outcome is a little garden. Why so? Because if you get recurrent growths and if you are not managing it ideally, there is a possibility of progressive placental interceptions and the patient can uh, give birth, the mother can give birth to uh, babies with low birth weight. There, can, there are even episodes of stillbirth which has been uh, documented. So it is very important that you make a diagnosis of GPP and manage it accordingly. The other variants of generalized postural psoriasis are one is annular, which is commonly seen in the infants. Classically, there will be annular lesions surrounded by postures, and there is a central area clearing, which uh, to a uh, normal uh, looking uh, person would or a normal eye would look like a teen. And uh, the postures on the surrounding will subside with peripheral desconnection. What is important is that even though there are extensive generalized postures with these sort of lesions, the constitutional features are less pronounced, very minimal. And the prognosis is quite good. Then is the exanthematous type of generalized postural psoriasis. It is there given in our literature, but there is a confusing overlap with the drug eruption, which is what almost exactly similar morphological picture to acute generalized exanthematous postulosis. This type of generalized postural psoriasis, which is documented, occurs with no systemic symptoms, and it is usually an acute eruption. And instead of drugs, it tends to follow infections, especially bacterial infections. The other type of generalized postural psoriasis is the infantile and the juvenile type. Usually, uh, onset occurs in the first week of life, but it can occur a little later in life too. Uh, it is extremely rare and it runs a benign course. But if it occurs a little later than the first week, then what, or uh, maybe it occurs after a few months of birth, then a very uh, prominent history of either napkin psoriasis or diaphragmatitis or seborrheic dermatitis is usually obtained. So you have to look for that. So when a case like that presents, uh, the automatic question from your examiner would be, what other history would be try to elicit? So in that, you need to remember this particular point. The other types are the one which is 
relatively common in our segment, especially in the top, is the circinate and annular type. And the linear type is just a uh, namesake variant. Now, this circinate and annular type is of a subacute form. It can also occur in a recurrent chronic form too. Here, you have a slow spread, and it is usually in a centrifugal fashion, with the pustules gradually appearing periphery, uh, nearer to the advancing edge. And the, that area will scale up. And the pustules will dry up those areas and leave behind what is described as a trailing fringe of scale. Now, this trailing fringe of scale, once you see that, probably you might mistake it for the other condition or the other dermatological condition where you can get a trailing scale. That is the erythema annular centrifuge. So that is one thing which you need to require. If somebody asks you what is a circinate and annular psoriasis close needing, then in the healing stage, it would be a erythema annular centrifuge. Now, coming to the localized forms, which are relatively benign, but when you look through the literature, they are not uh, exactly benign. They can have their systemic uh, implications too. So, one of the, one, the first one is the palmoplantar type. In certain textbooks, it is said as palmoplantar postular psoriasis of bark. Mm -hmm. And it is a chronic variant. And females are supposed to be the predominant ones affected with this particular entity. Usually seen in the fifth to sixth decade, but it can occur in uh, younger age groups too. Classically, it involves uh, the thinner and the hypothenia variants of the palms, and the soles and heel can also be involved. And some textbooks say uh, if the instep area is involved with pustules, that is a pointer towards a uh, plantar postular psoriasis. Now, the triggers in this are stress, infection, and smoking. I put smoking in capitals because that is one of the entities where smoking has a definite trigger. And uh, quitting a habit of smoking will go a long way in giving significant relief to the patient. The association, as I said earlier, it can have a uh, joint association and uh, the classical SAFO is described. I think all of you know, but I just said, SAFO is synovitis, acne, osteolosis, hyperostosis, and osteitis, which can also occur as part of this particular entity. Another thing is that there are significant literature which says a positive association with gluten. So a gluten-free diet might be beneficial in such cases. So that is worth trying in such things. Second entity is the acrodermatitis continua of halobrid. It is relatively rare and it affects the digits only. As the term indicates, acrodermatitis. The tip of the digits are usually involved and the peri, uh, what you call, angle area is significantly involved and it will interfere with the nail growth. And subsequently, the patient will have various forms of nail dystrophy and nail switches. Even it can lead to complete shedding and there will be complete loss, uh, and which is classically termed as anonychia. But what is extremely important is that if somebody asks you what is the clinical hallmark of acrodermatitis continua, the pustules can there be there in many other conditions. But a preceding glazed erythema of the affected area would be a very strong pointing towards acrodermatitis continua. Even though this is a localized um, type of postular psoriasis, what you need to remember is that it can progress to generalized postular psoriasis too. And just like your GPP or bones in the or to generalize other postular psoriasis, it can involve the other mucosae like conjunctiva, oral mucosae, and tongue. And analysis migraines is also described in acrodermatitis continua of halo. Now, what are the inciting factors of the triggers? A very favorite question when postural psoriasis is put as an exam or as a case for discussion. The most important and the first one to mention is that if the patient is on systemic steroids, it's a sudden withdrawal of systemic steroids. Secondly, drugs like salicylates, lithium, iodine, hydroxychloroquine, phenylglucosone, penicillins are also said to be one of the drugs which triggers postural psoriasis, but there is a slight controversy which whether it is the exanthematous type of one which is confused with AGP to which penicillin is attributed. Then the interferons are also uh, one of the uh, group of drugs which are uh, supposed to be the triggers. Thirdly, a very important one is a strong topical irritants. Now these irritants are those which are used as classical treatment modalities for psoriasis too. So use of TARFs, anthralins in sensitive individuals can induce a flare of postural psoriasis. Secondly, system, uh, topical steroids can, especially if they are uh, advised to be applied under occlusion. And one thing which is there in literature, which I want to carry back is zinc pyrethrin. 
you know there there are many uh, anti dandruff shampoos now which are coming out with uh, ketoconazole with zinc pyrethrin and zinc pyrethrin can actually um, precipitate a vascular flare and can cause induce vascular uh, I have not mentioned uh, the physiological condition. Pregnancy itself is supposed to be one of the triggers. Infections, especially staphylococcal uh, bacterial infections, are said to be a trigger. Light, it can be the sunlight or it can be the phototherapy that we do, which can also induce phosphorus. Hypocalcemia, this is one metabolic condition which is extremely important. So, when you are listing out the triggers, you should remember hypocalcemia because hypocalcemia can induce phosphorus psoriasis. And vascular psoriasis can indirectly also aggravate the already uh, reduced calcium levels. It can also cause or precipitate hypertension. Then idiopathy, that is without, there are many times when you may try to look for causes, but we don't get the causes. So there is, uh, it can also occur without any treatment. Now, what are the differential diagnoses? There are many. Uh, I think I will just tell those uh, with uh, the condition with which you suspect. So uh, the ones I think this is the one which we described earlier. The, um, acute generalized exanthematous postulosis, which has got an upper downside with minimal systemic features and a shorter duration of action. Now, drug etiology is the one which is important and it is not uh, secondary to uh, any infection. So, that is how you differentiate between an exanthematous type of GPP and aging. Postular drug eruption, these are close differential diagnosis. Pemphigus, especially acute pemphigus polyaceous and very rarely uh, pemphigus foliaris, can be confused with generalized vascular psoriasis. So there, Zang can not be, uh, help you out. And maybe even if it doesn't help out, your investigations, especially immunoproxenes and biopsy will be extremely helpful. Impetigo, not a common single uh, lesion or a few lesions, but generalized uh, impetigo, especially in immunocompromised region, could be a close differential diagnosis of generous vascular uh, psoriasis. Dermatitis herpetiformis, infected eczemas, hmm, can be a close differential diagnosis. Now, one a serious condition which can be a close differential diagnosis is the acute cutaneous lupus, which can present with um, pustules on a erythematous background. Then, disseminated herpes symptoms, which can present with pustules, especially in immunocompromised, can be a close differential diagnosis. Now, for palmoplantar pustular psoriasis, your pustular type of pomphalix is a common entity. Now, as you know, uh, pustular psoriasis is a neutrophilic disease. So, sweet syndrome is also a very close differential diagnosis. Sweet syndrome, as you know, is also associated with fever, neutrophilia, and pustular eruption. So, sweet syndrome is also a close differential diagnosis. So, generalized pustular psoriasis. Now, what are the investigations? Now, this is something which is a favorite. Uh, you might be asked to list out the general investigations, but I'll just mention what are the uh, specific investigations which can yield you uh, changes in generalized pustular psoriasis. So coming to the hemogram, the patient will present to you with neutrophilic leukocytosis. Though literature says that in very early stage of GPP, you can have lymphopenia. Uh, later on, it will be the classical neutrophilic leukocytosis. Then there will be raised ASR and raised acute phase reactions, especially raised CRP during the course of generalized pustular uh, psoriasis. Hypocalcine. So, so calcium levels have to be estimated. That is one thing that you need to remove and then, then hyperuricemia because of the extensive tissue damage, you can have hyperuricemia too. What is the bedside test that you will do? Some simple test which can do. So, what is the commonest confusion with this? You see a pustule. So, what is a pustule usually do? So, usually uh, the concept is that it could be secondary to bacterial infection, but uh, this is a pustular surface. So, how you differentiate? So, what is the investigation that you do? You do a gram staining of the pus, and uh, as expected, in petigo and all, you will get bacteria. But in pustular psoriasis, it is a non-infective condition which has got no um, what you call organism inside. So it will only be teeming with neutrophils. Or in other words, it is a sterile pustule. So this is one of the entities where you get sterile pustules. And uh, naturally, the in, in your viva and well as your exam, the next question will be which are the other entities where you can have a sterile pustules, like your subconal pustular dermatosis, meters and all. Then, as I said earlier, pustular psoriasis is not just confined to the skin only. It can also involve the joints. So you need to screen the patient for psoriatic arthritis using imaging as well as it is always advisable that even if you don't uh, get anything uh, visible in your um, assessment, you need to have a rheumatology consent because they will be able to pick up subtle signs of early psoriatic arthritis. And if uh, you intervene, then probably you can reduce the morbidity associated with the arthritis in the future. Now, histopathology is uh, contributory. 
the differences, uh, I've just highlighted the differences. The other things are common. The parakeratosis would be uh, prominent there. Then you will have the uh, suprapapillary thinning and all those things. But uh, you can have a um, retrogenesis, elongation, everything is uh, described. But what is classically said is that the Munro's microabsis, which is supposed to be a specific type of psoriatic histopathological binding, is extremely prominent. Even to the extent that people say it is a Munro's macroabsis. This occurs because of the migration of neutrophils from the papillary dermal capillaries to the upper layer of the epidermis. Secondly, because of the extensive edema in the papillary dermis and uh, extending on to the epidermis too, there is a spongy type of appearance uh, and in which the neutrophils are distributed and which is called the spongiform pustule of coil. So, but what is to be uh, remembered is that even though spongiosis, we classically say is not associated with psoriasis, so maximally it is described in early, very early psoriasis. In GPP, spongiosis is very prominent because of the extensive papillary and epidermal edema. So if you have a histopathology finding which says there is edema, then um, and you have a spongiosis, don't uh, discount GPP. It is a marker of generalized possible psoriasis. Now, how do you treat? Uh, basically, management would be uh, the first and foremost is that if it's a generalized possible psoriasis, especially once in bush type with constitution symptoms, admit the patient immediately, if possible, in a dermatology ICU and institute all the supportive care, especially the fluid management, temperature control, correct the metabolic complications, and all. When it comes to probably later on, lifestyle modification is extremely important, like cessation of smoking, stress being a thing, a stress management is extremely important. If it is not possible for you to probably uh, address that, then you have to seek professional help. Clearing the infective fossa is extremely important because if that is persistent, that is one of the reasons for the flares. Protein supplementation has to be done because pustule, in such conditions there is significant hypoproteinemia and gluten uh, avoidance has been suggested in certain, especially the palmer plantar type. Uh, what you need to do is that uh, there has to be a withdrawal of topical irritants, if any, which has been used, and you have to avoid topical irritants in future too. In limited disease, your topical steroids, topical tacrolimus and catspertrine will work. Phototherapy, even though it is supposed to induce to, it can be used for localized form, especially targeted phototherapy like a hand foot on your palmer plantar, possible psoriatic lesions. Generalized, uh, muscular, uh, muscular, sorry, generalized uh, Postural psoriasis of pregnancy uh, treatment is, uh, I'll come to it later on, but what is prescribed as part of the gynec or the obstetric treatment is early delivery because you don't have to wait for a very long period uh, or else the significant placental insufficiency will set in. So, what is the first line systemic therapy? Retinoids, especially acetretin, is the first line systemic uh, therapy which is suggested. I'm not going to the detail because if I go into detail, it will take a very long time. But if somebody asks you what is the drug of choice on the first line systemic drug which is to be given, these retinoids. Though there are newer schools of thought which says retinoids, sometimes even biological standards, but retinoids is conventionally the first line systemic. The other alternatives, methotrexin. The only thing that you need to remember is that you have to give it in higher doses than in large psoriasis. Uh, so you have to start with probably 50 milligram per day and high later on. Cyclosporin is an alternative at 4 to 5 milligram per kilogram per day. Now this uh, one, what you, uh, what I want you to remember very, very much when you leave this session is uh, the fact that systemic steroids are uh, used in generalized postural psoriasis, and it is said to be the drug of choice for generalized postural psoriasis of pregnancy. The second alternative is cyclosporine. So what you need to remember is that systemic steroids are generally contraindicated or it is supposed to be avoided in psoriasis, but it is uh, indicated in certain indications. This is a very favorite question of the examination. So why? Which are the uh, settings where you will get systemic steroids? One is generalized postural psoriasis of pregnancy. Other is Disabling type of psoriatic arthritis and any psoriasis with metabolic complications where this will work. The biologicals, uh, all the biologicals are said to have some role. Uh, TNF alpha inhibitors, the tenor set infliximab, all those things are supposed to be the first line drugs which are used and people are comfortable using it, though they are there are reports of failure, uh, significant amount of failures too. So these are all there. Only thing is that for all of them, uh, the plaque psoriasis of moderate to severe weight and variety is supposed to be the uh, approved indication. Now, other alternatives are torchicin, 0.6 milligram per orally, 
um, some people even say to give two to three times per day. Mycophenolate has been tried. And this, another thing that you need to remember is, I said that that's an entity which is relatively common in our population, anular and sarcinate type. Now for this type and pharmacoplant of cyclosis, doxycycline is extremely useful. So much so that even alternative practical terms like doxy-responsive dermatosis and all has been made for such entities. Then Dapson. Dapson is supposed to be extremely good because this is a neutrophilic condition and it works extremely well in neutrophilic dermatosis. In pediatric patients, again, acetatin, cyclosporin, methotrexate, etanercept, etc. are the options. Your biologicals can also be tried, but they are only in the nascent stage. Now, what are the complications of osteoporosis? Uh, due to the extensive posterior and extensive uh, involvement in the skin, there is significant protein loss, which leading to hypoalbuminemia, which can secondarily also cause hypocalcemia. There is significant amount of staphylococcal secondary infections, and there is a very high possibility of the patient going into septicemia. And secondary to that, you can have significant temperature dysregulation, especially hyperthermia. These entities all in together can cause oligemia and can cause acute tubular necrosis and fatal acute renal failure can, uh, can ensue. Nutritional imbalance is extremely uh, common. Uh, all sorts of malabsorption you can get. Liver damage is there, which can occur secondary to the septicemia, secondary to all these things. And without a particular reason, uh, what I'm just telling is that of unknown, uh, what you call, causation, polystatic jaundice is supposed to be very common in telomeres for So you need to uh, look up for that also. The exact cause is not common. So we'll uh, probably go into the final part of it, which is the recent developments. Now, why I brought it uh, now is that. Uh, for, a, for, for us, for when we were studying and all, Pastoral psoriasis is a part of um, the Gen Y's, what you call the psoriasis group, and it has got no other. But the research is going on so much so that to the entity that the current concept is that Gen Y's psoriasis should be probably treated differently from your Clark psoriasis. And it is now said to be an auto inflammatory neutrophilic dermatosis, probably a different entity, which has got some overlap with the psoriatic uh, classical psoriasis. So, whether it will be removed or uh, so in future is something to be uh, seen. But as of now, they say that GPP has got a different histopathy, basically because now the, uh, the insights into pathogenesis says that it is predominantly intermittent 36 driven, and the TS17 sort of uh, thing is only a part of it, and there is a probably an association of it, or what is referred to as a cross -talk. So it is an interleukin 36 given pathogenesis. And another important thing is that GPP can be acquired type, or there is a familial type of GPP which has been described. And the synonym for that is DITRA, or it is a def or DIRA. It is a deficiency of the interleukin 36 receptor antagonist. And this is something which is there in your body. And there are, and uh, that is, uh, there is a specific gene for that. And when you have a mutation in the, uh, in that particular gene is the interleukin 36 receptor um, gene, which is interleukin 36 RNG. And if this gene has undergoes a mutation, then you can have an interleukin 36 receptor antagonist deficiency. Now, when that is deficient, your interleukin 36 will be um, produced and it will be active in greater strength and it will actually the causer or inflammatory cascade bomb. So that is the reason uh, which is attributed to this particular entity. And this is something which is said to probably account for a familiar type of generalized uh, postular um, psoriasis. And the genetics uh, is something which is coming up a lot for postular psoriasis. The three classical mutations which are described are the interleukin 36 RNG mutation, which is supposed to be autosomally recessively inherited, which confers a risk of GPP to the individual. The CART14 or the caspase recruitment dominant 14 gene mutation for autosomal dominant inheritance, and the Serpina1 and Serpina3 gene. Serpina means it's a serine protease antagonist 1 and 3 gene mutation are there. So these are the things uh, which are uh, supposed to be the things which can actually trigger or which can actually act as a backdrop for occurrence of postular psoriasis. Now, DITRA, uh, as I said earlier, uh, it is rare, but it is life threatening and auto inflammatory. And what are the features of it? It is early onset generalized postular psoriasis, then significant multifocal osteomyelitis, and elevated acute phase reactants. Is a triad which is given for this particular entity. 
And in this case, what is to be remembered is your conventional modalities won't work at all. And you have to go for interleukin-1 uh, antagonists, uh, which are the mainstay of therapy. Uh, the interleukin-1 antagonist that we know is the anakin one. But what is reported is that anakindra can also be not responsive in certain entities. And so what is suggested is that you give a combination of anakindras with systemic steroids. Is it common? Not reported, but we don't know whether it is uncommon. This could be one of the reasons for uh, several of the generalized postular psoriasis not responding normally to your conventional therapy. The other one is the CAR-14 mutation. Now, this is extremely important because herein, uh, one thing which you can probably get is a family history of psoriasis and family history of pityriasis rubra pyrilis. So this is said to be familial GPP or familial PRP. So what are the features of it? There's an early age of onset and most important is the facial involvement. You get plenty of lesions on the cheeks, on the brow, on the forehead and on. So it's, it's a very prominent facial involvement like the previous picture. CAR-14 mutation uh, cases also will be unresponsive to your conventional therapy. Now, the pathogenesis, this is a term which is there, which I just highlighted so that you can mention it if it comes for a theory or when it is asked for a you not you don't get time to elaborate too much. So, there is a crosstalk between both the innate and adaptive immunity. So, uh, a very uh, skeletal sort of uh, like flowchart of pathogenesis would be uh, in a genetically susceptible individual, any of these triggers of skin injury will stimulate keratinocytes to release the catheter in LN37 which will stimulate the surrounding active characteristics on which interleukin-36 precursors are there, which are subsequently activated by proteinases to active. And this active interleukin-36 will enhance the production of different chemokines. It uh, enhances recruitment of neutrophils, uh, monokines, lymphokines, and it will uh, bring in and activate all the antigen presenting cells too. Then there will be subsequent formation of the significant pro-inflammatory cytokines and the, uh, again, that uh, will have a circular sort of fashion that it will again trigger neutrophil proteases, which will again activate the latent interleukin precursors to active, and that inflammatory cascade goes on and on. Uh, this is a, a diagram of how it goes about. You can see the various mutations which are there, which are like the serpina, uh, which will block the neutrophil proteases, the CAR14, all these things. But when there are mutations, like an interleukin-36 uh, interleukin receptor antagonist motivation and all, there will be uncontrolled interleukin-36 activation and the subsequent uh, inflammatory cascade. Now, this is a crosstalk which I mentioned earlier. Uh, it's a little busy slide. I am not going to detail. Uh, you can probably take a snapshot of this if you want. It's uh, from the, both generalized postural psoriasis and plaxis. So looking at this, you can see that there is a slightly distinct pathology, but there is a little bit of crosstalk between the cytokines on uh, either side. So, uh, coming to the recent updates in the therapy, uh, apramilast, uh, which is supposed to be relatively resistant uh, or relatively less effective in postural psoriasis, is now used uh, in very large numbers with significant improvement in the refractory form of lambda postular psoriasis. And there are even reports, for example, there are not multiple reports, I just came across one article where there was improvement of generalized postural psoriasis with the institution of apermidase. So we don't know. Probably phosphodiesterase uh, has got its own uh, role in the mechanism of psoriasis. Maybe time will only uh, elucidate what is the extent. So apermidase is formed, so maybe that might also be part of your regular therapeutic armamentarium in future. Then tocilizumab, the interleukin-6 antagonist has been used with uh, relative success in um, generalized postural psoriasis. I think anakindra I mentioned, especially when you have an entity like Ditra, when it is extremely resistant, where you have a deficiency of this particular entity, the interleukin-1 receptor antagonists can work extremely well. Now, in patients with GPP, where anakindra has been uh, withdrawn due to its own hypersensitive reaction, you need to understand that all these are not magic molecules. They've got its own fair share of adverse effects. So, if uh, there is an entity, uh, there are there are reports where Anakindra has shown significant hypersensitivity reactions. In such an entity, they have used this particular uh, uh, drug called Kanakinumab, hmm? which is an interleukin one beta antigen. These are all names, but we, these will probably help you in uh, probably compiling the final answer being put in for your treatment of postural psoriasis. Then this particular drug is also supposed to be used, uh, Givokisumab. Even uh, which is supposed to be good in severe recalcitrant GPP. Mind you, you can just probably mention it as in a 
few cases uh, and this is uh, this is not yet being uh, yet approved now this is the most exciting area which is there basically as i said now the gpp treatment is moving to the interleukin 36 signaling pathway so this particular drug is the most exciting kid on the block this is the novel monoclonal antibody spesolimab and which effectively blocks the 36 uh, interleukin 36 signaling pathway and it will alleviate the inflammatory response in gpp and uh, for uh, information this is the fda approved drug in uh, and this was uh, approval was received in september 2022 that is only a few months back so you can uh, see that how uh, fda is fast tracking this because of the uh, increased number of cases of gpp in the west where it is not responding to the conventional modalities and not even responding to the conventional biologies uh, now um, like interleukin 36 pesolimab a newer molecule is also coming up the trials are going on. It has gone through the phase one and it is moving into the phase two. It is the imcidolimab, which is another anti uh, interleukin 36 receptor. And the preliminary research, according to literature, is encouraging. So uh, maybe uh, in the coming future, we might see this drug also coming up and maybe other drugs too. But what you need to remember is that the pathogenesis in psoriasis is uh, um, what you call it. It's gone, cha it's gone uh, changing and newer and newer insights are coming up with more and more genetic as well as uh, inflammatory research. So uh, today, this might be the stage. Tomorrow, some other cascade might come up. So in short, uh, the pathogenesis has not been completely elucidated, but some amount of association with newer and newer types of pathways in the pathogenesis has been um, uh, actually formulated by various research. So there are lots of projects going on. It's, uh, lots of exciting uh, molecules are also in the pipeline. So I think uh, with that, we probably come to the end of the session. Uh, what I've been trying to uh, tell you through this is just a bird's eye view of generalized muscular services. And my endeavor would be uh, successful if you can go back and read and build up on what has been told me. Uh, it has been, uh, it has been a, um, what you call, a wonderful academic exercise for me. I thank Vitus for giving me this chance to uh, read and probably update myself on this too and getting newer information in history. So I'll just uh, leave you with uh, this support by Theodore Roosevelt. Do what you can with what you have where you are. Now why I said so is because uh, you heard of me telling about Spesolimab, all those things and all. But you are going to get uh, areas where you will have only a set of armamentary of drugs. So you need to be confident with what you have and you need to uh, do what you can to uh, know how to use those uh, drugs judiciously and effectively. For that, you need to have a very uh, strong academic, um, what you call your foundation. For this, you have to read and you have to make sure you are updated and you uh, discuss among yourselves, your peers and your consultants and learn and try to be better in what you can handle with what you have. So that is why I thought I would put this, uh, even though that came as a probably a little bit of dampener at the end of all the recent updates. Thank you. Thank you again, Brighton, sir, for the opportunity. Thank you for the patient listening. Sir, should I go for the questions? Or, uh, yeah, sir? Uh, uh, thank you, Dr. Biffy, for a very wonderful talk. And, uh, of course, uh, I, the last slide, the insightful slide, very good. Uh, I think all of the postgraduates should take up this particular quotation which uh, Dr. Biffy has uh, shown and it is very relevant also so congratulations dr biffy for the wonderful talk so uh, you go ahead with the questions dr biffy so i uh, i probably tell the uh, questions then uh, i think uh, it's being uh, recorded no it is being yes doctor i'm recording so shall i shall i uh, shall i move? Oh. yes doctor yes doctor Okay, uh, which clinical type of muscular psoriasis has also a synonym? Dermatitis repens of Crocker. Radcliffe Crocker had actually put this term, dermatitis repens. It is still used by some of our very senior experienced dermatologists. So, which clinical type of muscular psoriasis has a synonym? Dermatitis repens of Crocker. Let me just uh, add that uh, 
there might be the questions which are not which i have not uh, touched because i feel that when you have a webinar the pgs uh, or whoever is there who is attending the webinar if they do a preliminary reading it will benefit them a little bit so if you have read probably you will come so it's a can i move to the next question yes doctor you can move second question doctor so i said that uh, annulus migrans of the tongue is associated with uh, pustular psoriasis so in which other dermatological disease other than pustular psoriasis is annulus migrans of the tongue described in which other dermatological disease other than pustular psoriasis annulus migrans of the tongue is described Shall we move to the next? Expand the abbreviation K. C A P E. Now this is something uh, which is connected with something in the genetics which I mentioned today itself. So K. It's just a clue. What is K? It is something which is uh, which is there in most of the literature as a independent entity. Which accounts for certain conditions which are um, there. I think I don't. I won't um, break down this, this thing. Again. So please expand the abbreviation K. The clue is it's connected with the genetics of change. Final one. Just write true or false. Spesolimab is the only approved biological agent for GPP flares. Is this statement true? Is this statement false? Spesolimab is the only approved biological agent for GPP flares. Are the answers ready? I think you can just wait. Yeah, yes, sure, sure. Once once I get a go ahead, I will give the answers for those questions. Meanwhile, uh, I will announce the winners of the. Previous uh, question cues. The first question winner is Dr. C. A. Nagesh. Dr. C. A. Nagesh. Is he there? Is he there? Doctor? Dr. Nagesh? Yeah. yeah. Show, the, show the photograph, image. Nagesh, Dr. Nagesh. No. Is it difficult? That's okay. The second question, the winner is Dr. Adira PV. Adira PV. Adira PV. They haven't uh, written the name of the college. The third question is Dr. Abarna Praveen, Abarna Praveen. And the fourth question, the winner is Narmada Prasanna, Narmada Prasanna. So once again, I repeat, first question, winner is Dr. C. A. Nagesh. Second question, Dr. Adira PV. Third question is Dr. Abarna Praveen and Fourth question, Dr. Narmada Prasanna. These are the winners. Congratulations to the winners. And uh, we will wait for the, uh, the results of the second uh, set of questions. Uh, 
Dr. Nagesh mm-hmm. and Dr. Rajara PV are asked to send your uh, mobile number and institution. Doc- Dr. Abarna Pravin from Kannur Medical College uh, and Dr. Narmada Prasanna from Vinayaga Mission Medical College, Salem. Okay, congratulations, congratulations. So, please do send the mobile number and uh, uh, institution name. The winners. No, can I go ahead with the answers, sir? Can I? Yeah, yeah. You can only be easy to get that. No? You can Fine. go ahead. So these are the answers. The first one was uh, acrodermatitis continuum of halopio is the entity which is referred to as dermatitis serpents of Procter. So the answer would be acrodermatitis. First answer would be acrodermatitis continuum. The second one, uh, which I said has a connection with uh, genetics, is CART14 mutation. Sorry, one second. Sorry, the second one would be, uh, there is a slight change. Uh, the third one is, uh, the answer would be the one for the second. That is annulus migrants. The condition would be Reuters disease. Reuters also you get annulus migrants. So the, for, the, for the technical uh, support team, the second answer would be Reuters, the one which I have mistakenly said as third, that is the second one. But the third one will be the answer which I have mentioned in the second, that is uh, the cave. Uh, I mentioned the genetic mutation, no? it is CART14 mutation associated papillosquamous eruption. I said that CART14 mutation has association with PRP and psoriasis, which is the cave. CART14 mutation associated papillosquamous eruption, a newer described entity. And the final statement, which I said, which I have asked for true or false, it is a true statement because it is the only approved, FDA approved drug for generalized muscular uh, psoriasis flies. All the other drugs have been approved for other entities with uh, off-label indications for using muscular psoriasis. So it's a true. So in order, acrodermatitis continuum of halopio will be the first answer. Sorry, Reuters disease. Thirdly, CART14 associated papillosquamous eruption for Cape, and the fourth one is a, it's a true scheme. Thank you, Dr. Bifi. Uh, uh, Dr. Saumya, are you here? Are you here, Dr. Saumya? Yes, I'm very much here. Yeah, yeah. Um, just uh, tell you our uh, um, answers of the case. Right, sir. Uh, the first question, the answer was Irwin C, as we had discussed, who defined skin failure. The second question was uh, about uh, uh, the uh, causes of uh, peripheral edema. Could be anything of the four causes that we had uh, talked about, whether it is cardiac failure or hypoproteinemia or uh, inflammatory edema or capillary leakage. Uh, then the third question was about who uh, was the person who introduced uh, uh, derm- ICUs in dermatology first, it was René Touraine. Uh, again, most of you have answered it correctly. And the fourth question was, uh, which type is associated with a bad, worse prognosis? And that was the subtype of uh, exfoliative psoriasis, that was the acute subtype. Even uh, most of you have answered all the four questions correctly. We have, the winners were the ones who answered it first. Thank you, Dr. Saumya. Thank you. Thank you for the question too. Uh, the two um, faculty are um, I mean, should be commended for their uh, extremely beautiful presentation. And thank you very much uh, for enlightening us. Uh, I mean, especially me for uh, I mean on the topic which you have done, as well as it will be beneficial to the. Sir, is it audible? Yes, doctor. Yes, doctor. Yeah. It, so it uh, uh, it is beneficial to the uh, postgraduate, especially during their examination. Uh, it will be most beneficial. Thank you. Thank you to Dr. Bhikhi. Oh, and... Thanks. 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 Can you name of the winners of the second uh, set Sir. of Oh, yes, doctor. Yes, doctor. Second set is ready, doctor. One second, doctor. Just be online. 
we will announce the winners in a couple of seconds. Uh, doctor? Yeah. Doctor um, winners are ready, doctor. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yes, doctor. Uh, first, doctor. Yes, doctor. I've sent to you. First winner, the name is not uh, written. Yes, doctor. Department of Skin is there. Uh, no. What is the name? I don't know. Ma'am, Department of Skin, doctor. Okay, who is the person? Who is the person? I don't know. Anyway, okay. second question is um, and the winner is Aradi Manon. Third question is Abarna Praveen. A fourth question is uh, the mobile. Uh, mobile. Uh, uh, Redmi. Redmi, Redmi 9. Red. Redmi 9. Redmi 9. Redmi 9. Who is the Redmi 9? I think it uh, has. Video no, doctor, kind, kindly, kindly unmute yourself, doctor. Who is Redmi 9? And kindly tell me the name and mobile number, doctor, so that we can send the certificate and gifts to you. Redmi 9. Please unmute and. Uh, Both your microphone and uh, video. Redmi 9, I think they're still in the muted format. Dr. Redmi 9 is uh, Dr. Divya. From? Uh, that, uh, that she has not given, but in the chat box she has given. Okay. Dr. Dr. Divya. Dr. Divya, this is Dr. Redmi 9. And uh, uh, Department of Skin, I don't know, Doctor. But we got mobile number. Ah, yeah, yeah. She's from uh, Doctor, she is from Vinayaga Mission Medical College, Salem. Vinayaga okay. Mission Medical College from Salem. Yeah, yes, you contact contact yeah, okay. for sure. video. Sorry, uh, to mobile and uh, um let's pass the certificate and the sure, sure, sure. sure, 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 sure. Oh, okay. thank you. Thank you doctor, all. Uh, uh, one more thing, Dr. Doctor, uh, uh, Department of Skin is Dr. Lakshmi Priya from Salem. Lakshmi Priya from Salem. Okay. okay. Lakshmi Priya from Salem. Congratulations. So, uh, next webinar, uh, we will meet by the time. I mean, um, we will say goodbye. And uh, Navin, can, can, do you want to make any announcement? Uh, nothing, doctor. So thanks for the opportunity for uh, for giving to our East West Pharma. The exclusively, uh, two speakers are done well for uh, for the benefit of our postgraduates. The thing will continue. So kindly, our postgraduates, those who are attended, for this kindly encourage your colleagues also, your 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 colleagues also to attend the forthcoming programs. And the gifts will be announced and the gifts will be handed over by our uh, field force shortly to you. And thanks for wonderful opportunity for the uh, giving for us. And I'm uh, my my hearty thanks to. Dr. Titan, sir, and speakers personally. Thank you, doctor. Thank you. Thank you very much.